My wife and I love to play cards. We, uh, when it's just the two of us, we'll mostly play a game called cribbage uh, that I learned from uh, my grandfather. He was not a patient man, so it was hard to learn how to keep score because he wouldn't teach it to you. He would just tell you uh, how many points you had scored. But when we play cards, uh, often we have a family we vacation with and we will play late into the night. Uh, sometimes we have to get rid of a bunch of the cards so we can play a game called Euchre, which only uses the nines up through the aces. But we'll also play spades and hearts and another game called Hand and Foot. And some of those games require partners. And in a couple of those games, when you have a partner, if you get dealt a really good hand, you can tell your partner to put down your, their cards and you say that you're going to go it alone. And you're going to play against the other two all by yourself because your hand is so good, you don't need any help. Your partner could have some cards that could help, but you don't get to see those because you've chosen to go it alone. Now, when we play cards, this doesn't happen all that often because you don't get, get, get dealt that good of a hand uh, all too frequently. But in life, sometimes uh, I think we regularly do end up going it alone a lot more than we might in a card game. I want to read the passage again that we heard from Second Peter this morning. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the, dawns, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So if you listen to the two ends of that, at the beginning it says, Peter's saying, we did not come up with some cleverly devised myths, meaning what story they are telling about Jesus did not come from within them. It's not something that they came up with, sat down and used their own imagination and creativity and resources to come up with. And then at the end, it says, uh, and by the way, no one interprets and prophecies scripture uh, on their own. Uh, that has to come from the Holy Spirit. So the two bookends of this passage we heard, both are about uh, this not being something of them. They say, we were eyewitnesses to what we saw. We heard these things, right? It was coming from outside of them, not something that they came up with on their own. So Peter is telling whoever is listening that we did not go it alone. This was something that happened to us. Now, often in our lives of faith, we do, I think, end up going it alone, uh, thinking that uh, maybe we're disconnected from community or that we all have our own interpretation and so whatever we think something means is what it means. But then in life, we end up in those places too. I remember a couple that I had some conversation with and I've had this conversation more than once. The wife had been diagnosed with cancer and as we were in conversation, I said, well, what did the kids have to say, grown kids? And they said, well, we haven't told them yet. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, we don't want to worry them until there's something really to tell them. We're just going to not share anything with them. Also, then they said, and please don't tell anyone else in the congregation or otherwise, because we don't want to be a bother to anybody. We don't want to be a burden. They had been dealt a tough hand, and in being dealt that hand, they decided at least for a while to go it alone and to be disconnected from their family and their friends and their faith community, all these resources that could have walked alongside them. Not too long ago, I encountered another family who came to visit here. Uh, during the week, they had been sleeping in their car. That's a tough hand to be dealt. There were lots of reasons that they had gotten to this place. And one of the things we will do with our compassion friends now and again, when we encounter people who are homeless like that, is give them a, a couple of nights in a hotel so they can have showers and a bed and the things that you don't get when you sleep in your car. And as I shared this with the mother, tears ran down her face and she said, no one has ever helped us. 
They had been going it alone. They have a whole community of people, right? And they are sleeping in their car all by themselves. And the difference between these two stories is one chose to go it alone when they got dealt a tough hand. The other didn't really choose it. They didn't have another option. No one would help them. So they were going it alone in a whole different way. Now in our culture, we are really trained to go it alone. Uh, we're trained not to ask people for help, not to look weak, not to uh, share things with people or overshare. And there's all kinds of ways we get to that choice of going alone. Sometimes it is out of a good hearted intention of not wanting to worry or not be a burden or a bother to anybody. Sometimes it's not a choice. Other times there's something that we carry with us of guilt and of shame. That same mom talked about uh, feeling like she was the only one that had the problems that she had, right? That's what happens when you're going it alone is you don't know that there are other people on the same journey. But that is not a unique experience to someone who's sleeping in their car. There are many people who gather here every Sunday who think that their problem is unique to them, not realizing that other people have that same problem, but we're so conditioned at going it alone that we just kind of stay in our little space and try not to be a bother. And whether it's guilt or shame or whatever reason we choose, we don't invite other people into that journey. And that's when we get dealt a rough hand. Sometimes we have a good hand. We have all of the resources we need. Things in work or at home or in retirement or in school are all right where they need to be. And when everything is right where it needs to be, do you need any help? No. So it's easy to sort of go it alone in that space as well because we don't think we need any help and we don't think we need any community. And sometimes we don't see all of the help that has gotten us to where we are. And so we end up in that place of going it alone. Now you come back to this story and it's a reflection back to that moment of transfiguration. We heard the story of the transfiguration this morning. This is Peter looking back some years later saying, gosh, remember when we were at the top of that mountain and we saw Jesus transfigured and we heard this voice and in hearing that voice, we knew then that the prophecy was confirmed. Peter's looking back. Now this is also post-resurrection. They have experienced the death of Jesus. They have experienced the rising of Jesus. Before that, the transfiguration of Jesus. So he has had a whole journey of change that he can look back and see that something different has happened. Now, this is the same Peter who, on uh, the night in which Jesus was betrayed, how many times did he deny Jesus? Three. Three. And then what did he do? Wept, but he kind of ran off probably by himself, right? Did he feel completely alone in that moment? No doubt. And if you think about Jesus's whole life and ministry, uh, it had to be a lonely place, even when he was surrounded by crowds, because everyone in that crowd was coming because he either inspired them or they were hoping he would heal them or something would happen if they came and followed him. So everywhere he went, people were focused on him. And he was the only one that they believed could do the things that he could do. And that's a lonely space to be. But he never lived in that loneliness, right? He surrounded himself with the 12 and then a whole bunch of other disciples and was constantly in this space of community until he gets close to the cross. And there's that night where he prays. And what does he pray? Take this from me. This is hard going it alone in this space. And then he ends up on the cross. Now on the cross, he's not entirely alone. He's got some neighbors on their own crosses, but one of them is taunting him and the other one's also saying, hey, uh, stop taunting him. This guy's the real deal. But he's in his own way trying to ask Jesus for something, right? So on that cross, he's still alone. Uh, one of the things he says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a, a whole sense of being uh, utterly abandoned and alone. But in that abandonment and in that loneliness on the cross, Jesus meets us in our loneliness. And whether we choose to go it alone or whether uh, everyone else abandons us and leaves us alone, whether it's from shame or grief or success that we end up in that place of loneliness, Jesus on the cross meets us there. And even on the cross though, he is building community. In the gospel of John, he looks at his mother and a beloved disciple and commends them to each other's care. Even in that place of suffering, he is looking to build community. And when you think about the sacraments that we have, do you baptize yourself? 
No, right? It's a communal activity where parents make promises for their children or people themselves, you know, ask to be baptized, but then the congregation makes promises that we're on this journey together. When Jesus comes up with uh, this last supper gathering that he brings the disciples together, it's a meal. It's a moment of community. And when we gather around this table, we never do it alone. We always do it in community. So part of the gift of this story is that we have never been alone. We talk about one of the images that we have is, uh, for the church is the body of Christ. Jesus did not give us a checklist of doctrines to make sure that we are in the right space of believing, did he? Did we come up with one ourselves? Sometimes we do, right? We want to police who's believing right and who's not. What Jesus really gave us was a community. He gave us the body of Christ. In baptism, in the meal, in the ways that he gathered people around him. Uh, when we come to Monday, Thursday, we will wash people's feet. And Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm showing you how to be community together, to serve one another and to love one another. This is the gift that we are given by Jesus. In his death and resurrection, he gives us a whole community of people. Well, uh, it's been a while. I heard a, a story on the radio that uh, some atheist groups were starting to gather in kind of the way congregations do for fellowship. They didn't want any of the believing and they didn't want any of the ritual of the church, but they wanted to gather and do the things they remembered maybe doing if they grew up in the church in this place of community because they wanted that. And this radio story was seeming to try to distinguish uh, between, well, the church is its doctrine and its beliefs, and they were trying to do this other thing that was somehow attached to the church that was fellowship. But I think that gets it wrong. Jesus gave us community. So when we are gathered in fellowship, we are being exactly what Jesus created us to be. And when we gather in worship, we are being exactly what Jesus created us to be. Now we have rituals and we have beliefs and all of that is part of that shared journey of gathering, but it is the gathering that is the gift of community that Jesus has given us. I wanna read this text again. And um, this time I want uh, you to listen and count. So uh, if this side can count how many times you hear the word we, and this side can count how many times you hear the word I, and when you hear we, pay attention to who it's referencing, and when you hear I, pay attention to who it's referencing. Make sense? For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. How many we's did you hear? Six, five, seven, we'll average it out to six. And who is the we referring to? Right, Peter's the one speaking, so it's Peter and the disciples, maybe James and John that were with him and the rest maybe that saw the, the resurrection of Jesus. How many eyes did you hear? One, who was it? God. So in this story, we see God as this great eye that has gifted people with this community and with this gift of life. And when Peter talks about it, all he has to say is that we got to see it. We were eyewitnesses. We got to hear it. And when Jesus tells the church in his resurrected space who they are, he regularly tells them, you are my witnesses. You are the ones that got to see it. You're the ones that got to hear it. And your task is now to go tell other people about it. So as we head into this season of Lent that starts on Wednesday, I invite you to think of these candles uh, that you will take with you in light. Uh, as an opportunity to reflect on that uh, sort of going it alone that we have a tendency to do versus the gift of community that we have been given. And here's what I love about this. Uh, how many candles does each of you have? One, right? So you can light that candle 
at home by yourself, and it can represent in some time of Lent a reflection of what it means then when we go it alone and to think about the ways that you might do that that aren't super healthy for you. But then, uh, if you're lighting that candle and I'm lighting my candle, who's lighting our candles? We are lighting our candles because we are the body of Christ and we are on this journey together. So even as you're in that space of reflection, do not forget that Jesus has gifted us with this whole community to be a community of faith and hope and love. And it's in that community that we gather and practice and love and share and care for one another and look out for one another and walk alongside one another so that whether we get dealt a good hand or a rough hand, we can know that we do not go it alone because Jesus never leaves us and never lets us go. And we get to be uh, the hands and feet of hearts and hands, feet and hearts of Jesus that make that true so that all people might know God's love. Amen.